This is an incident that took place when Jesus was 12 years old. And as I mentioned this morning, we don't hear anything again from the Lord until He reaches the age of 30. So it's an isolated interest, in, incident which makes it interesting. Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey. And they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrow. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them, and came to Nazareth, and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Here before us is the story of Mary and Joseph, searching for their 12-year-old son Jesus. When they realize he is not in the caravan, they leave to return to Jerusalem. I mentioned that in this day and age, that seems like a real strange thing. Banks will probably take away your kids and lock you up. But this was a different time. They did things like that. They would travel in caravans with family and people from the towns and villages and cities. They all knew one another. And it was almost like a, a family reunion in these caravans. They would go from wagon to wagon or from uh, whatever they were riding on and just fellowship with one another. So this was not an unusual thing that took place. For the record, Jesus did not sin. He didn't do nothing wrong. God cannot sin. They returned to Jerusalem, searched for Jesus for three days before finding him in the temple. I mentioned this morning that you would think that that would have been the first place they would have looked for him, if for no other reason, to go there and bathe the situation in prayer. They find him in the temple, the house of God, sitting among the rabbis, asking them questions and hearing their answers. Needless to say, they were upset, and they asked Jesus why he did this, knowing how worried they were. Jesus answered them. He was as surprised as they were. They were surprised that he would do such a thing, and he was surprised that they didn't realize he was about the Father's business. They knew that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the Chosen One. They knew that. For the Heavenly Father uh, revealed it to him. The indication seems to be that they didn't think that his service for the Father would begin at such an early age. That's the indication I get. They were probably thinking when he reaches manhood, then we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But here he is at 12 years old. He already knew who he was. He already knew what he was called to do. You may find that your child... Your grandchild, your niece and nephew has the touch of God in their life. Bathe them in prayer. Don't ever discourage them in spiritual things. No telling what God might be fixing to do. Hannah prayed for a child. Yep. Told God that if, if you give me a child, I will dedicate that child to the Lord. She had that child and when he became of age, probably around seven, eight years old, she uh, had yep. Eli raise him in the temple. <clears throat> One of the most godly men you'll read about in the Bible was Samuel. She dedicated him to the Lord. What is something we could do today? Dedicate our children to the Lord. I mentioned this morning that this incident was a turning point in the life of Christ. It marked the first steps in preparation for his ministry. Now, he wouldn't go into the ministry until 30 years later, but this was the first step. And for Mary and Joseph, it was the realization that they would soon have to let Jesus go to follow his calling. So for both sides of them, for Jesus and his parents, this was a key incident. I believe that's why God saw fit to reveal it to us. Jesus returned to Nazareth with them, but the dynamics of the relationship had now begun to change. 
And with that introduction, I want to continue looking at the subject, the Father's business. Notice first with, with me, what is the Father's business? Jesus told his parents, I must be about my Father's business. What was he talking about? I can tell you what he wasn't talking about. Jesus wasn't talking about opening up his own carpenter shop or working in his father Joseph carpenter shop, his stepfather, I should really say. Joseph wasn't his real father. He was his parent. So Jesus wasn't talking about goals for his business career. Joseph was not Jesus' father. God was his heavenly father. Amen? Amen. And the business Jesus was talking about wasn't the carpenter business. He was talking about God's business. Just what is God's business? I'll give you a couple things. Number one, God's business is spiritual business. Amen? Amen. God's John 4, good. 24 declares, God is a spirit. And they that worship Him God's must worship, worship Him spirit in spirit and in truth. And truth. Amen. God is Jesus good. announced His calling at His hometown synagogue in Nazareth. He was handed the scroll of Isaiah, and he read from Isaiah 61, and he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, yep. because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the pure. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Jesus began his ministry with the Spirit of the Lord upon him, because it's spiritual business. God is good. He faced his first trial in that wilderness of temptation. He was out there in the wilderness for 40 days going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil. And we are told in Luke 4, 1, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And then, in verse 14, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. He went out to that wilderness in the Spirit of God, and he came back the same way. The Father's business is spiritual business. One of the problems I see in churches today is that they're trying to do the Father's business in their own strength. That'll only take you down the road so far. Mary, Martha found that out. Martha was serving God, was living for God, was busy for God. But she was serving God in her own strength. And it can't be done. It's spiritual work. She hit a wall, got burnt out. Even worse is when folks try serving God and living for God in the flesh. That's even worse. It won't work. Why? Because we are involved in a spiritual war with the forces of darkness. And this war can only be fought in the spirit. And the work can only be done in the spirit. You try to do the Lord's work in the flesh, it'll leave a bad taste in your mouth. Because yeah. our flesh has no interest in the things of God. The Father's business is spiritual business. God's Secondly, good. the Father's business is the salvation business. Jesus declared in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and yes. to save that which was lost. Which is talking about every one of us till we come to know the Lord. Okay. And again, in Luke 5.31, And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick, I am come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus was about winning souls. The Father's business is soul winning business. Amen? Amen. Here's the thing. God doesn't want anyone to burn in hell. That's true. We make that choice by either accepting or rejecting salvation. God don't want to see anyone burning in hell. It's his desire that all would be saved. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So there it is. God's business is the business of salvaging lives, of healing broken lives, and restoring lost souls. That's God's business. In Mark chapter 16, the risen Savior told the disciples in the Great Commission that as that we as believers are to make God's business our business. Mark 16, 15. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. 
That's God's business. You have your Bibles, turn over to Matthew chapter 5. I want you to see this. And here's another passage that indicates what the Father's business is, and it's winning souls, reaching out to those that are lost, seeking the lost, whatever the cost. Uh, my, Matthew 5, 14. Matthew 5, 14, the Bible says, Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Yep. Here's the key verse. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. That's it. Amen. We are living in a world of darkness that's getting more violent and depraved with each passing day. People are dying and heading straight to hell. Unless someone reaches them with the light of the gospel. We're here for a reason. And it's not to just take up space. We are called to be shining lights to this world in darkness. We are called to reach the lost, whatever the cost may be. We are called to be about the Father's business of pointing souls to Jesus. And there is a third thing. The Father's business is serious business. This matter of living for God and serving the Lord is no game. It's no game. As mentioned earlier, every minute of every day, lost souls are dying and heading for hell, where they will spend eternity tormented in that furnace of fire. We all have family, friends, loved ones, co-workers, neighbors that are lost, and their lives are going in the wrong direction, and their souls are hanging in the balance. And that's a serious thing. We ought not to ever take the souls of men lightly. Amen. Jesus said that there's rejoicing in heaven over one soul that is salvaged. One lost soul that is saved. There's rejoicing going on. The pearl of great price is talking about the price of one precious soul. It can't be measured. You can just reach one person. And they get saved and turn their lives around for the yes. glory of God. You can't put that in dollars and cents. You Man, just God's good. Save a soul. I mentioned this morning that the enemy is on the move. He's trying to ruin marriages and wreck homes. He's trying to destroy churches and rob us of our kids. Christians are dropping like flies because they are not serious about the Father's business. We are at war. And this yep. fight won't be over until God calls us home or the Lord returns, whichever happens first. And if we don't start taking the devil seriously, we're going to be sent to this week, literally put to the meat grinder of life. Jesus tried to warn Peter at the Last Supper that the devil was stalking him like a roaring lion. Peter wouldn't listen, didn't take the threat seriously. And it just about finished him in his service for the Lord. I don't know what kind of year this past year has been for you. I pray that it was a good year. It's possible that it wasn't. But I can tell you this. The clock is ticking. And the time of Christ's return draws near. And if we hope to accomplish anything for the glory yeah. of God, we must make a serious determination to live for Amen. him while we can. We must strive to be committed Christians. Is there any other way? Strive to be committed in our service for the King. As stated this morning, Jesus was 12 years old, and already he was about the Father's business. I think of those that are newly saved, baby Christians, babes in Christ. God will speak to your heart if you're listening. It doesn't matter if you've been saved a week. Or save 10 or 20 years. You've got God dwelling inside you. And if you listen. Be still and know God. You'll hear that voice of God. And He will start to move you. He will start to speak to your heart. And give you direction. For your life. There is a fourth thing concerning the Father's business. Number four. The Father's business. Is steadfast business. Often during the winter months, I'll see a lot of stores that go under. Closed signs. 
They end up out of business. Some are lasting only a few months before they're shut down. Sometimes you walk to the mall and it's like a ghost town. Out of business, out of business, out of business. Sometimes these businesses fail because of bad management or lousy service. Maybe it was the economy. Perhaps the business just wasn't competitive. Whatever the reason, the business no longer exists. And this problem isn't exclusive to businesses in the world. Now, I don't consider the church a business, but in a sense it is. It's the Father's business. And a lot of churches are shutting down due to lack of interest. As hard as we're trying to build up this church and have an impact on folks outside these doors, the devil's working just as hard to try to shut down the Father's business. That's what we're up against. And if we don't support the church with our time, our efforts, our prayers, our finances, no telling what the future may hold. That's the reality. For the Father's business to succeed, we have no choice but to be steadfast. That word steadfast means we're not going to give up. We're not going to quit on God. Amen. We're not going to bail out of church when things get rough. The only way to be steadfast is to determine in your heart God, good. that nothing is going to stop you from living for God. Amen? Amen? Nothing or no one is going to keep you from the Father's business. Oh, I like that 1 Corinthians 15, 58. The Bible says, Therefore, my beloved, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Abounding the work of the Lord. That's giving it all you got. That's living the abundant life, the victorious life. Why settle for being a marginal Christian? Why settle for just getting by, doing just the minimum? When the Bible says we should abound in the work of the Lord. Yep. I mentioned last week, Jesus gave us his best when he laid down his life on Calvary's cross, can we do any less than give him our best? <clears throat> Notice that this passage states that we are to be unmovable. One of Satan's strategy is to get us to give up ground that we've gained in the Lord. Lord willing, when you've been saved for a little while, you start to make progress in your spiritual journey. We sing that song, Higher Ground, and that's what we should be striving for, a closer walk with God. When a Christian begins giving up ground, one step forward and two steps back, it's called backsliding. And when a Christian starts to backslide, they begin to slip away from the Lord. It may not be anything noticeable at first, just a little slipping here, a little slipping there. And before you know it, they're a lot farther away from God than they used to be. Once they start that slide, have you ever been on a slippery, muddy hill? You make a little progress and then boom, right back to the bottom of the hill, you're covered in dirt, spitting dirt out of your mouth. Not a pleasant thing. And it just gives me a mental picture of what it's like when a Christian backslides. Once they start to slide, it might be a long time before they get back to where they used to be. And they might be covered in a whole lot of dirt in the meantime. Another problem is that Christians sometimes get restless. They get a little antsy. They lose interest in the Father's business and get caught up in the business of this world. It happens. We get distracted from the Father's business. Next thing you know, our focus is on what the world's got to offer, the cares of this world. Still others may think that the grass is greener somewhere else, and they move on, never finding what they're looking for. The Bible says we are to be unmovable. And I picture a, a big granite stone a mountain, if you will, that ain't going nowhere. Be unmovable. Don't budge not an inch. That means nothing should move us from where God has us unless God himself tells us to go. I've seen Christians over the years make a mess of their lives by making one decision after another without knowing the will of God. That's asking for trouble. God's going to either open up a door and clearly let you know, or He's going to shut the door so tight that no amount of bang on that door is going to open it. That's a good way of knowing the Father's will. The 
best thing you can do is just be steadfast where you are, doing what you're doing in your service for the king yeah. and wait on God for further instructions. Praise be to Jesus. He'll let you know. All right, here's the new orders. Here's your new marching orders. The other thing about being steadfast when it comes to the Father's business is that this is no tent job. You know, sometimes folks got these tent jobs. They ain't going to put a whole lot of effort in it because they know they're only going to be there for a few months at most. This is no tent job. We are not part-time help. This is not seasonal work. And there's no retirement in the Father's business. So you can count all those things out. We are to serve the Lord till He calls us home. You get a job out in the world, many times you may want to work a lot longer, and they'll give you a pink slip saying your services are no longer required here. You're too old, too long in tooth. That'll never happen in your service for the Lord. You can serve God as long as you're living and breathing and your heart's are pumping. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Serving till God calls you home. When that day comes, we'll get all the rest we need when we're up in glory. But until that day, we must stay busy for God, steadfast in our service for the yep. Lord. There is one last thing. The Father's business is a sacrificial business. Jesus was just a child of 12, but already he knew that it was going to cost something to be about the Father's business. It was going to cost him his life. When did Jesus realize he would die a horrible death? Probably as soon as he could read. Probably as soon as he had comprehension of, of spiritual things. He never wavered in that. Never tried to dodge it. Set his face steadfast to go to the cross. And the Lord challenges us in the same way. Luke 9, 23. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Dying to self. May even die a martyr's death. No telling. Jesus told his parents he must be about the Father's business. Listen, you may be the only one in your family trying to live for God. You might be the only Christian at your job where you work. Maybe you've been serving God for years. And now at the end of the journey, you're a little weary in the way. Maybe you're starting to wonder if you got any gas left in that tank of yours. Galatians 6 9 declares, and let us not be weary in well doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. That's it. The Father's business is just about done here in this wicked world we're living in. We'll soon be pulling out of here. We'll soon be heaven bound. Once we're gone, the tribulation will begin. And I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, let alone people that I care about. Let's be serious in whatever time God has given us. Steadfast in our service. Let's give ourselves to the Father's business. Amen. Be used to God in some wonderful way. And just leave the results with Him. Let's pray. God is good.